Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our last event of the Papillon seminars. Uh, our topic will be today the interventional thyroidology. Uh, we have three excellent presenters. Uh, first, Andy Po Papini will speak about uh, the outcomes and indications of thyroid minimally invasive treatments. Thereafter, we follow with Giovanni Mauri's lecture. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Arcos de Akpar will present uh, how to execute a thermal ablation procedure. So first, uh, uh, let me ask you to introduce Andy Kupapini, but I don't think that I need to introduce him because he is uh, one of the most topic, most top uh, thyroid experts uh, since two or three decades. He is scientific director of the Regina, Regina Apostolum Hospital in Albano, Rome, and consultant endocrinologist in the same institute. Uh, he is a lecturer at, of endocrinology at the Postgraduate Medical School of the Catholic University of Rome. Uh, his scientific contribution covers more than 100 original manuscripts, textbook chapters, and Italian and international guidelines. Uh, these uh, interests fall mainly in the following areas, ultrasound assessment of thyroid trend and minimally invasive treatments of thyroid lesions. From 1990, uh, Andy Pope Raffini proposed this technique as a major diagnostic tool for thyroid nodules and defined the most important ultrasound risk features for thyroid malignancy. Uh, Professor Papini pioneered thyroid international procedures and his work has been pivotal in image guided thermal therapy of benign thyroid nodules and non surgical management of thyroid malignancy. Professor Apini, dear Enrico, please present your lecture. Dear Tomash, many thanks for your kind words. Oh, well, you were too good to me. And uh, good afternoon to all our friends of the Papillon course. As um, Tamash said before, today we address uh, an issue that until a few years ago was a, a pioneeristic approach, but is now rapidly spreading all over the world. This is a new opportunity. And, uh, Let's see why this is a new opportunity. Until now, we uh, a perfect approach to the diagnosis of thyroid nodules. And so for the vast majority of thyroid nodules, we are able to understand if they are benign or malignant. But still, we have a a great number of uh, thyroid procedures that are due to benign nodules, clearly benign nodules. And this image summarizes what is the state of art in Europe. That is, uh, we have uh, the majority of thyroidectomies or lobectomies that are performed for benign conditions that just induce local symptoms or are worrying the person due to a progressive growth. And as you can see, even in the case of a correct surgical approach, that is amythyroidectomy, we have nearly half of the patients that anyway need some kind of a substitution therapy that is a lifelong treatment and there is a limited, but not completely negligible number of patients with uh, uh, permanent complications. And uh, of course, uh, we are trying to decrease the risk of surgical complications and of, uh, well, side effects for instance, using a video-assisted 
thyroidectomy, like on the left, the monitoring of the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the center, or new complicated approaches to thyroidectomy, like the trans or the trans oral surgery. But of course, this is expensive, time consuming, and exposed to, well, other types of complications. And so the age of thermal ablation started with this feasibility study in 2000, that is 24 hours ago. This study demonstrated that it was possible to insert a spinal needle with 21 gauge into a large nodule and introducing through the needle a very small fiber optic to deliver thermal energy to the center of the nodule, destroying the tissue. And uh, of course, after this first phase that well, was uh, about eight years long, other modalities of a, a thermal ablation were created. The second one, and probably the most widely used in uh, the world, is uh, the use of a radio frequency that was proposed the, from a South Korean expert, Jung Baek. The uh, radio frequency was used uh, before Baek with a rather, uh, well, hurting uh, large devices, but Baek uh, was able to propose a different approach, that is um, a smaller electric needle, multiple treatments in different parts of the target lesions, and a wide treatment of large areas. And the last one, was the thermal ablation procedure that was proposed by General Feng in China with the use of microwaves. Microwaves are larger devices with a, a nearly blunt tip, and so the introduction is a, a bit more cumbersome than with the, the pr two previous techniques, but they are extremely powerful and they can destroy in just five, six minutes large areas of tissues. And what happened during these 24 years? As you can see, at the very beginning, we had a, a rather small number of papers that deal with this technique. But step by step, there was an increasing number of papers, and presently they are increasing more and more because these treatments are becoming very, very effective and at a very low risk of complications. We have a, a clinical significant decrease of nodal volume that is a, a more than 50% decrease of the nodal as stated by international convention. The control of local symptoms that is in parallel with the reduction in the volume. No cosmetic damage. And this for, especially for many women, is of paramount importance. The risk of complication is quite low unless you are unexperienced, but most important, there is no loss of thyroid function and no need of substitution therapy. And not last, you don't have 
to perform the treatment on inpatient because the patient can come perform the treatment and after one hour can go safely on. And so at the moment we have a first the animal research 1993, then case reports, then case control studies, randomized control studies, and meta-analysis. And finally, since 2020, step by step, the major scientific society in uh, thyroidology started to also produce guidelines. And so let's have a look at the, the guidelines and at their indication. Uh, the first guideline was produced by the South Korean Society of Thyroid Radiology. It was 2018. And in 2020, uh, we produced, uh, under the commission of the European Thyroid Association, the ETA uh, clinical practice guideline for thermal ablation in benign nodules. And then uh, we had a, a comprehensive uh, panel that included all the major societies in uh, the world that created a, a common statement about the use of radiofrequency ablation. And uh, what, what is the first point? The first point, recommendation one, is that uh, we all should start considering thermal ablation procedure as a real alternative to surgery for the selected patients with benign thyroid nodules that induce compressive or cosmetic symptoms as an alternative, of course, to surgery. And uh, of course, we are not talking about large multinodular goiters because uh, in these goiters we don't have a single target but we have a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland and so in these cases rare cases we should consider this treatment only for patients that are not in any way candidate to surgery and are suffering from major uh, local symptoms. And uh, after that, we have a, a further uh, option, that is ethanol injection. Ethanol injection is a technique that started before the use of thermal ablation and uh, in the 90s, early 90s, it was used also for solid nodules. But we searched the thermal ablation procedures because the treatment is perfect when you are managing mostly cystic nodule, is painless, is inexpensive, is quite rapid, but when you inject ethanol inside a solid nodule, you have a seeping of alcohol outside the nodule, and so you can induce sharp pain, fibrosis, and you are, are not able to predict what is the volume and the shape of the structure. And so, currently, Ethanol injection should be used by all the operators who are confident with the ultrasound-guided uh, fine needle aspiration 
a first line of treatment, but for cystic nodules only. And uh, a further problem is uh, the management of uh, hyperfunctioning nodules. Uh, the treatment of thyroid nodules as an uh, Italian group for minimum invasive treatments, we released uh, a few, uh, I would say, um, strong evidence about the possibility to uh, decrease both the size and the function of toxic nodules with the thermal ablation. But unfortunately, unless the nodules are quite small, that is definitely under 10 milliliter in their volume, or the treatment frequently is followed by a relapse of the thyroid and hyperfunction. And so this should be considered only for those patients who are not candidates for radioiodine, for instance, because they have a, a, well, a, a treatment with the amiodarone that makes impossible the treatment with the radioiodine, or because they are not candidates due to a high anesthesiological risk to surgery. And more recently, in the end of a last year, also the American Thyroid Association released a practical consensus for the management of patients with minimal invasive treatments. And we uh, have nearly the same recommendations that we have in the previous documents. And uh, just to talk about Italy, uh, we performed a, an Italian guideline for the uh, National Institute of Health on the uh, approach to the uh, thyroid nodules who are becoming large and produce local symptoms. And from where we started, in uh, 18 years, in Italy were performed more than 700,000 hydrotectomies. And we had uh, just a, in, in, a, an unchanged approach to surgery, because uh, as you can see, total hydrotectomies did not decrease substantially. And so this represents a major problem in Italy as in other countries. And uh, we performed also a pharmacoeconomic evaluation of both the direct and the indirect costs. And uh, so, it was demonstrated that the net cost, considering the devices and the time of the operators, was uh, just over 1,500 euros for thermal ablation and about 5,000 euros for thyroidectomy. But besides this, that is the productivity loss that was due to the hospital stay, that is about 1,000 euro for thyroidectomy and less than 200 euros for thermal ablation. And so in 2023, uh, at the end of the last year, uh, a panel of experts uh, produced the uh, 2023 European Thyroid Association Clinical Practical Guidelines for Thyroid Nodule Management. And uh, this guideline that should be the guide for those who operate in Europe 
and are dealing with thyroid nodules, state again that ethanol ablation is the first line treatment for pure or predominantly cystic benign thyroid lesions. Thermal ablation should be considered for solid nodules that cause local symptoms. And what is important, we should anyway be quite certain that the nodule is benign because of course sometimes we can have a deceiving cytological features for instance in uh, well differentiated uh, follicular thyroid cancers and so we require a confirmatory FNA, FNA that demonstrates after the first one a benign nature of the node. The only exception is for the completely spondiform nodules that are considered by definition benign. And uh, what we suggest for the late control of these patients, of course, after one hour, the patient should have a, a, a color doppler or contrast announced that is better evaluation with ultrasound in order to rule out a possible bleeding that is not a threatening condition, but anyway should be ruled out because uh, otherwise uh, a small but nasty hematoma could be produced in the neck. And most importantly, if especially in large nodules, there are areas of the nodules that were not treated. In this case, it's possible to plan a second treatment after a valuable time on the remaining parts of the, of the thyroid nodule. Then, if everything is okay, the um, controls can be performed after six and 12 months. In between these two days, there is the maximum decrease of the nodal volume that, of course, immediately after the treatment is not decreased at all because there is edema and inflammation. And then, if everything is fine, as generally it is, a control can be performed at three, four, five years intervals. And uh, anyway, we have problems also with uh, malignant thyroid lesions. Not everything is uh, uh, completely uh, defined. And especially for those small papillary thyroid cancers that once were called microcarcinomas and now are called papillary microcarcinomas under 10 millimeter in uh, dimension. And uh, we know very well that Ito, Sugitani, and other Japanese centers demonstrated how, generally speaking, the aggressiveness of these tumors is very limited. But even if we have a just from 10 to 15% uh, of cases in which at 10 years, the progression of the disease was clinically relevant, that is one out of nine patients. If we disaggregate the data, we can see that not all patients are the same. For instance, we can see that the progression to a clinically relevant disease 
is uh, much more frequent in young and middle-aged patients than in the elderly. And most important, there is also a change according to the diameter because large part of the lesions that were treated by the Japanese authors were very small, down to four, five, six millimeters. But if we evaluate the data, we can see that when the nodule was nine to 10 millimeter, the risk of progression to a clinical disease was nearly five times greater than when the nodule was equal or lower than eight millimeters. And so there are a few variables, young age or middle age, and a nodule that is just under one centimeter that suggest a more aggressive treatment. And for this reason, again, we in 2011 demonstrated with a feasibility study that was possible in a patient that was at a high surgical risk to destroy completely the malignant cells and then to follow the patient without any problem. The patient died of a decompensated cirrhosis five years after the microcarcinoma treatment without any local or regional relapse of the disease. And uh, of course, we have now a large number of papers that come especially from the Far East, because now in the Far East, they are performing this treatment on a large scale, especially in China. And as you can see, well, this is a demonstration of what happens. There is a paper published on thyroid in 2023. We can see that performing two core needle biopsies in a different part of a treated area, a complete ablation was demonstrated by 96% of the patients. And of course, this is important, but it is also important to see that while the percentage of patients that demonstrated a persistence of a few malignant cells was under 3% for those nodules that were up to 10 millimeter, for nodules that were up to 15 millimeters, we had a, a sharp increase. And this is due to a problem. That is, when we perform a treatment for oncological reasons, we have to destroy at least two millimeters of a safe tissue all around the nodule. And so with the increase in the diameter of the malignant nodule, there is a logarithmic increase in the volume of the of tissue that we have to completely destroy. And this is another paper, uh, also in this case was a, a recent paper, and it was a, a retrospective analysis that matched a, a high number of patients, over 300 who underwent radiofrequency, and they were uh, well, paired with the same number of patients with a, a similar condition who underwent lobectomy and were followed up for 48 months. And as you can see, there was no difference 
in the uh, frequency of uh, uh, relapse or spread of the tumor outside the lesion, but we had a, a much shorter procedure time, a much shorter hospitalization, that is nothing against three days, and a significantly lower major complication rate. Major means permanent complications that are most frequently damage to recurrent laryngeal nerve or permanent hypoparathyroidism. And so what is uh, the cases in which we should consider the possibility of minimal invasive treatments for small papillary thyroid cancers. Of course, always when the age is old, when there are relevant comorbidities, you remember the old lady with the decompensated cirrhosis that was the zero case in our study. And of course, you don't have aggressive forms or again, persons who refuse surgery because, for instance, of aesthetic problems. But of course, the ultrasound examination is of pivotal importance because not all the small papillary cancers can be easily and effectively treated. And so we should prefer a central location well-defined margins, absence of a contact with the capsule of the thyroid, and no evidence, of course, of extra thyroid spread. And last but not least, we need a interventional area with a specific expertise. And what favors surgery, of course, all the other way around. And so, young age, presence of worrisome features of cytology, or difficult areas to be treated under ultrasound guidance, and of course, a high volume surgery, because we know very well, and it's demonstrated, that when you have a surgery that performs more than one or two hundred thyroid surgeries a year, you have a, a much lower rate of complications. And uh, we have uh, also the use of these treatments for local metastasis, lymph nodes, and for distant metastasis, that is liver or bone. But of course, this is beyond the basic approach of this conversation. And so lobectomy remains the first choice approach for most microcarcinomas. Active surveillance remains an accepted option or selected, also selected on a psychological base because we know that many patients with microcarcinoma over the years, drop off the active surveillance and require surgery. And we can consider minimal invasive treatment if there is a surgical risk, comorbidities to be prioritized. If the patient is unwilling to undergo surgery of active surveillance, but of course, we should choose the treatment modality based on the center competencies and always the patient preferences. And so it was a, well, a rather fast run in a, a bit complicated area, but I hope that at least a first well, image 
of the rule and of the potential future of these techniques uh, was uh, sufficiently clear. Thank you. We lost your presentation. Hello? We lost your presentation. Uh, you stopped sharing your content. Um, all right. Now it's OK? No. It suddenly disappeared. And when disappeared? At the last uh, uh, sentences, I, I, I just uh, told you when it disappeared. All right, but anyway, the vast majority of the presentation. Yes, it, the entire was uh, seeable, but when I uh, interrupted. Uh, well, I, I can give a comment if you like. Okay. Okay. The comment is that these are still new techniques but that now they are widely used and all the data are confirming that they are effective both for decreasing the symptoms in large benign thyroid nodules and to destroy the malignant cells in small papillary thyroid cancers. And of course, the choice between active surveillance, surgery, is always based on primarily the patient's preferences, the local competence and expertise of the institution, and on the general condition of the patient. And so, Tamash, is uh, Thank it's clear? Yes, okay. All right. Thank you very much for this excellent, uh, comprehensive uh, lecture on this it, field. It was uh, a privilege. Okay, we, we are rich. So, uh, the discussion is open. Uh, you have the opportunity to ask in the chat. Until the first question arrives, I... Uh, ask you about the numbers. You presented that around 700,000 patients underwent thyroidectomy in an eight-year period. How to compare to these numbers uh, uh, the performance of uh, thermal ablation technique? Because Italy is, I guess, the leading country performing uh, non-invasive techniques. Uh, how many patients under well, the Yes, year? presently we have uh, about uh, 12 centers in Italy who are performing routinely treatment, and each of these centers treats as a mean from, I would say, 20 up to uh, 80 or 100 patients a year. Uh, we performed several large scale studies and presently we are uh, more interested in specific conditions. Uh, for instance, uh, what was the result of retreatment in patients that had a, a complete, a nearly complete, but not sufficiently uh, total destruction, and I, I would say that as a rule, uh, probably every year in Italy are treated uh, near nearly five hundred patients. Okay, so we should compare this five hundred to the eighty uh, thousand uh, in a year. So it is it has um, a great perspective to increase these numbers. Yes. Yes. Uh, we had a, 
um, last year we had uh, nearly 40,000 thyroidectomies. Of course, we must remember that a substantial part of these thyroidectomies uh, in our center, for instance, we have a 45% of the thyroidectomies for cancer. And uh, moreover, we have uh, several thyroidectomies for large size diffuse or multinodular goiter that cannot be addressed by thermal ablation effectively. And so probably we could aim to substitute about 20-25% of uh, surgeries with this kind of treatment. And uh, of course, we are far from this, but uh, it's also because at the moment, we don't have a satisfactory reimbursement from the National Health Service for this treatment. And for instance, in our hospital, the cost of a thermal ablation is about 2,000 euro, and the patient has to pay by his own pocket, or should have a, an insurance company that can pay for nearly all the cost. And so, of course, there is a selection of the patients that can afford this treatment. Okay, thank you much. We have two questions in the chat. Can you read this, Enrico? Oh, uh, I guess that I can read. And uh, in the meanwhile, I, I joined the, the meeting, so I want to I say hello oh, to, to everyone. Giovanni, everything was perfect. I'm, I'm sorry for the delay and also maybe I will be called because I'm on call. So I will have another patient in roughly 20 minutes. <laughs> well, uh, I, and so I, I would do this way if Tamash agrees. You can present your presentation and then if there are questions, I can answer okay. later. Okay. So, then we can we follow with your presentation, Giovanni. Because you have to leave in 20 minutes. Yes, if it's okay. okay for you. Then I ask you uh, to have your presentation. Uh, uh, I think that two words about uh, Giovanni Mauri. Uh, he is uh, recognized as a top two person scientist by Stanford University, the leading figure in radiology and interventional radiology based in Milan, Italy. He's inspired by his father, radiologist. Murray developed a passion for minimally invasive medical procedures, primarily ablation techniques. Uh, his notable work in the thyroid ablation distinguishes him in the medical community, emphasizing less invasive treatments with significant patient benefits. Please, Giovanni, hold your lecture. If you have to leave, I can uh, uh, finish your presentation because you send me uh, the video version. Okay. okay, so uh, let me know if you see my presentation yes, now. It's, it's okay. You okay, perfect. Can enlarge? Yes. Now uh, it's, it's okay. full screen. Okay, uh, excellent. So full screen, but we see a small. Uh, okay. Picture right. Maybe you can enlarge a bit more. One. Uh, let me okay. See this. Perfect. No. Perfect. Is, is is now at full screen? Now not full screen. Uh, what ten seconds it was full screen, but it is okay. So it's not a great problem. I can see if now uh, we see the the opposite and successiva also. Yes, <laughs> because I I have the main on the other screen. Uh, I can try to do this. And share again. Okay. To see if it works better. Uh, and and also we did the uh, we we tried to do that before, so I can do like this. And <clears throat> this. 
Now you see the, the full no, screen? We don't see Not yet. Anything. anything. Okay, so that's worse. Uh, Yeah. Now you see in this yes, way. I can see. Is that better than before? Uh, please maybe click on if the... I put full screen, uh, it shows in the other way. Okay. I so guess it's, 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 it's good. Better, very good like for this us. or like that? Like previously, maybe. It depends on you. It is the same. I guess it's no difference. Uh, but maybe the previous one was a bit better. Hello. We lost yeah. your pairing again. Every every time is difficult. Okay. Why is doing like that? It's now perfect. Absolutely perfect. Full okay. screen. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> I will show you something about the technique of these uh, procedure of ablation uh, techniques. Uh, maybe, and I'm sorry for the late joining, uh, Enrico already told you about the main indications for, for treatment that nowadays are uh, for benign nodular goiter. However, we have to remind that thermal ablations can be applied also in other settings like hyperfunction in thyroid nodules, micropapillary thyroid cancers, parathyroid adenomas, or, or even the neck recurrences. I'm not mentioning here the distant metastasis, uh, but still also uh, thermal ablation can be applied in patients, for example, with liver or bone metastasis. In this paper that was done by the minimally invasive treatment group uh, based in Italy, uh, we uh, discussed a series of uh, consensus statement for the treatment of benign nodular goiter which is the main indication and I will discuss mainly uh, today. The aim is only to reduce the volume of the nodule, not to make it disappearing or to completely remove it. And this is because we only want to treat the symptoms of the patient. And so we have to treat symptomatic patients and resolve the symptoms by reducing the volume nodule. We have not only thermal ablation, for example, for cystic lesion, always remind that ethanol ablation is, is a remain the first choice of treatment, is faster and cheaper. And also this can be used for a predominantly cystic nodule where you can consider a combination of ethanol and thermal ablation. The procedure is generally performed as an outpatient treatment. In our center, patients as their own bed remained for one day, is like a one day surgery uh, with a dedicated equipment and staff under local anesthesia. Sometimes I also perform a mild sedation for the treatment, Depend, uh, it depends on the, also the patient preferences. Under ultrasound guidance, so it is very important to have a very good ultrasound uh, machine and good expertise in ultrasound. And I like to use pre and post procedural contrast enhanced ultrasound, and I will show you uh, uh, why uh, later. This is a typical, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, this is a typical nodule that we treated, for example, with laser, and you can see the preoperative contrast enhanced ultrasound and the post-operative contrast enhanced ultrasound that shows you how the nodule is big as before, but completely or almost completely vascularized. What can we achieve is a reduction of at least 50%, often around 70, 80% of the volume at one year. And this correlates well with a good reduction of the symptoms. So the nodule is not disappearing, but significantly reduced in size. Again, I want to stress how it is important the ultrasound, not only the ultrasound machine, but that the operator has good skills in performing ultrasound of the neck and good knowledge of the anatomy and the structures that surrounds the, uh, the thyroid gland. 
there are two main techniques, laser and radio frequency. Also nowadays, uh, microwaves are coming uh, and appearing into the market, still are not widely used. Laser uses very small uh, introdu introduction needles, 21 gauge, like for fine needle aspiration. And we can use up to four optical fibers that can be inserted into that introduction needles with the different angle according to the different uh, guides that we can use. This makes the treatment a little bit easier because you have a guide for the treatment. There is a dedicated simulation software that allows us to have a prediction, you see the blue line here, of the ablation area. And the technique is the so-called pullback technique. You put the needles in the deepest portion, perform one ablation, and then by pulling them back, you perform the ablation of the more superficial uh, area of the nodule. Conversely, the technique of radio frequency ablation uses slightly larger uh, devices, still very small, like 18 gauge needles, and with different active tips from 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters that are inserted without any guidance, but using a free hand into the uh, nodule. It is recommended generally to use the transismic approach and to put the needle in the deepest portion of the nodule and uh, with the so-called moving shot technique to perform one after the other small uh, ablations of the uh, of the nodule one after the other what uh, we see during the treatment is the formation of hyperechoic area due to the gas formation that means we have ablated that area and we can then pull back the needle and perform uh, another um, uh, another uh, another ablation. It is easy to follow the treatment with uh, with um, ultrasound, and that's the part where you need some skill in using freehand ultrasound guided uh, ablation. It is the needles are cooled, and it is possible to stop immediately the ablation with a, a pedal. The result is of a completely hyperechoic nodule. That means that everything has been covered. And here is where I like to use uh, contrast media because uh, it enhances what is still viable of the thyroid and which is the part that has been uh, completely ablated and because it is completely devascularized. I would like to show you briefly a case, the recording of a case to highlight the technique. Of course, ultrasound evaluation of the nodule, Doppler evaluation of the nodule, and at this point, we have to plan uh, the treatment, the entry point, and how we want to, to perform the ablation. This is one of our rooms. I am an interventional radiologist, so I work in an, our angio suit. Of course, I do not use CT for these kind of procedures. But you see the patient is monitored. I have dedicated um, nurses, a good uh, ultrasound machine. It is important to have the patient with hyperextended neck and uh, to perform an ultrasound to plan exactly uh, the treatment, the day of ablation. This is how it is easy to prepare a contrast enhanced ultrasound is just, uh, it is provided with one vial uh, that is 4.8 ml, and it is possible to use half of the vial for the first imaging, so before the ablation, and the other half for the uh, evaluation at the end of the procedure. So with one vial, it is possible to perform two um, contrast enhanced ultrasound. In this case, you see, before the treatment, there was some anechoic areas, but also the rest of the nodule was uh, highly vascularized, at least as the other portion of the thyroid. 
This is how I prepare the table uh, with my material, and it is important to work under uh, uh, sterile conditions. It is true that the thyroid is full of iodine, but still we do not want to have any kind of overinfection of the necrotic area that we are uh, achieving with thermal ablation. So, sterile conditions, sterile neck disinfection, and sterile sterility for the operator with uh, gowns and um, everything. The sterile drape that I use on the neck of the patient to achieve the sterile field. And then the procedure is performed under local uh, anesthesia. I generally use mepivacaine, but it is possible to use uh, lidocaine, for example. The sterile cover for the ultrasound, and I use the uh, iodine disinfectant instead of the, uh, of the gel. I prefer that, but it's just only a way of doing that. So the red that you will see on the neck of the patient is not her blood but just the, the material that I'm using instead of the ultrasound gel. Then according to the needle that you have selected, you have to prepare it. Generally, needles are cooled, and so they have to be connected to a pump to have the circulation of the cold water inside the needle. The needle is very small, but still it is possible to have circulating water in it. That's one of the reasons of, let's say, still the some relevant cost because of the engineering of a, such a small needle with also cooling system uh, is, is not that cheap. Here you see cold water and, uh, and then the circulating pump. And then, oh, of course, we have to connect the machine to the system. This is the, the circulating. Uh, part of the of the pump uh, the pump is connected with the ablation system so when you start all to, so the pump starts and this is important to be sure of having all, always the cooling of the needle in, in order particularly to avoid uh, the skin burn local anesthesia performed again under ultrasound guidance particularly on over the skin and as you can see here in front of the isthmus of the thyroid where we plan to enter with our <laughs> electrode and also in front of the of the nodule mm -hmm. it is possible also to insert the um, as another small needle in order to achieve uh, the so-called hydrodissection uh, for example, to put some cold glucose solution all around the nodule in order to separate it from the skin, the pretyroidal muscles, and also uh, from the, uh, from the uh, lower uh, structures. As you can see from the same entry, it is possible to displace, for example, the carotid artery from the thyroid, and eventually it is possible to put the needle from the lateral entrance to achieve a deeper uh, hydrodissection of the nodule. At that point, we have to enter with our small uh, needle that is very easy to handle and to manage under ultrasound. and to move it into the nodule. In the meanwhile, we are looking at it uh, with ultrasound, as you can see here, how the movement correspond to movement of the needle inside the nodule. You start the ablation and you start seeing some hyperechoic area, meaning that we are ablating the tissue. And at that point, we can withdraw the needle. It is, of course, important to start from the deepest portion because the gas that will form will mask completely everything that is behind the ablated area. It is possible to monitor in the real time the power that is delivered and also the impedance. When the impedance increases, it means that the tissue is no more um, vital. Several different movements in order to complete <laughs> the ablation of the, of the nodule. 
and as you see the gas is reaching the uh, more superficial portion of the nodule that we wanted to treat. However, it is a little bit difficult to understand exactly and I like to use contrast to show that everything has been completely uh, ablated. And uh, this was just a quick overview of the only mainly for the technique. So I hope this was uh, clear enough to show you the technique of ablation. Thank you very much, uh, Mauri, Giovanni. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, I performed uh, uh, ethanol sclerotherapy, uh, but it was uh, quite uh, interesting also for me uh, because I never saw this uh, technique with such details. Uh, can you be with us or you have to leave? I think I have to go in. Just let me check. Okay, so the, the patient uh, arrived. I have uh, okay five minutes. Let's say they are okay. putting on the table. <laughs> okay, uh, I ask uh, the participants to ask first Giovanni. Thereafter, we turn back to Enrico because he, he will stay with us. Uh, any questions in chat? I see there is one about metastatic lymph nodes after thyroidectomy. If you want, I can take that easily Please. because it's where we started, actually. Uh, I well remember one case of a patient already treated with thyroidectomy and the three neck dissections, one single lymph node that really was refusing any other option, any other treatment, and was the first time a surgeon came to us asking to do something. We generally are quite fighting with surgeons that generally say, uh, okay, your techniques are not valid, uh, surgery is better. So it was a great pleasure for me to see the surgeon asking for our help at that time. And we started treating patients with metastatic lymph nodes uh, in 2010, let's say. And it is very effective. It can be done. Of course, and in that scenario is not the first choice. We only can treat, let's say, up to four lymph nodes, ideally not bigger than two centimeters. But it is a good option, and we included that also in the ETA guidelines as an option, ablation for metastatic lymph nodes. There's a question about the technique. Isn't enough to make color dopplers before and after the procedure? Yes, it, uh, the large majority of people uh, only perform Doppler. If you are familiar with the CUS and you have in your hospital, is very quick and still much more uh, precise than Doppler. But it, it is enough also to use Doppler. Okay. Other questions to Giovanni? If not, I, I guess we can uh, leave you because yes, you and Enrico, this. Enrico can answer. He, he can ask, uh, answer the exactly question. in the same way. Thank you, we Giovanni. Can, can change uh, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And sorry for for this uh, oh, problem. Okay. Thank you. Bye okay. bye bye. Bye. So you have the opportunity to ask uh, Professor uh, Papini. Uh, well, I, I have, uh, Tamash, two questions. Already. Yeah, please. And um, the first question is, who is usually performing ablation procedures? Well, when uh, we created the procedures, uh, we worked together the head of the interventional radiology and myself. And uh, after uh, several years of cooperation now in our hospital are the interventional radiologists who perform this treatment. And uh, of course, um, what is important is the confidence in the neck anatomy and in the use of uh, ultrasound guided procedures. 
so the procedures can be performed by endocrinologists with uh, a special experience like for instance uh, tamash who performs a lot of ultrasound guided uh, biopsy and of uh, ethanol injections for sure or maybe performed by interventional radiologists that work on a, a larger scale because it's what they do uh, during the whole day and of course for them it's more easy to perform this kind of treatment than to perform a, a liver embolization or and it will be especially used in the United States by surgeon, endocrine surgeons, because uh, it was uh, Gregory Randolph, Lisa Ann Orloff, and uh, other surgeons who collected the panel of experts for uh, the statement in the general statement and the following statements in the United States and that of course are less troubled by the uh, financial problems because in a, a system like the united states that is dominated by insurance companies the insurance companies will certainly prefer to pay much less for a thermal ablation than for a surgical excision of the disease. And uh, about the um, possibility to, to revise the presentation, I guess that there is no problem. Probably Tamash will make this available. And uh, about the use of a thermal ablation in metastatic lymph nodes. Well, uh, this is one of the major points. When we again published the feasibility in 2013, well, we published a few different conditions, but uh, it was a, a very elegant demonstration, the fact that a woman that already had total thyroidectomy with a central compartment dissection and then two lateral neck dissections in different times for relapsing lymph nodes of a medullary thyroid cancer had a, a third relapse of two lymph nodes that were metastatic with a a calcitonin in the serum that was nearly 300. And so we treated these two lymph nodes and the calcitonin decreased down to nearly normal levels. And so we had a sophisticated indicator of the deficiency of the treatment besides the fine needle aspirations that demonstrated the complete destruction. And so the specific approach should change the paradigm. Until now, the major guidelines tell you that when you have a suspicious lymph nodes, you should just follow it when it is small until it enlarges and becomes maybe greater than one or two centimeters and in the opposite the availability of this technique completely changes the paradigm because when you have a suspicious lymph nodes that is under one centimeter you if it's a single or maybe a couple of lymph nodes can sample them demonstrate that they are metastatic and then easily destroy them with a thermal ablation and it's much easier to have a complete ablation of a neck recurrences when they are under or up to one centimeter 
than when they are larger. And for these kind of retreatments in difficult areas, of course, we still prefer laser because with a, a chiba needle, 21 gauge, you can go through, for instance, the jugular vein without relevant problems and then perform the ablation of the lymph node. And so for such very, very delicate treatments, the less of intrusivity of uh, the China Chiba needle uh, is uh, to be preferred, in my opinion. For instance, when you have a, a paratracheal recurrence in the thyroid bed, it's of paramount importance not to damage the trachea because the tracheal fistulas sometimes described by well uh, two zealous treatments with the thermal ablation are a big problem require the intervention of a, a thoracic surgeon and so it should be avoided but placing carefully the tip of the laser fiber inside the recurrence, you can destroy safely it. Of course, you can perform also a hydrodissection in order to well, create a barrage between the thermal source and the critical area. But uh, it's quite interesting and for certainty, during the next years, we'll have a, a tide of uh, papers from uh, the United States describing all these different approaches. Because, uh, as you know, uh, well, uh, I am rather old, and so I had the opportunity to use and work and uh, publish on ultrasound when in the United States it was a completely underused procedure. And uh, what is the great resource of the United States is that when they become aware of the utility of a technique, they study it and uh, create the diffusion of the technique uh, in all the territory. And so this will be the future. And uh, uh, well, uh, I would be great, glad if also uh, the European countries could uh, well, follow this widespread distribution. And uh, about color Doppler or um, contrast enhanced ultrasound, well, if you perform color Doppler immediately after the thermal ablation procedure, you ha don't have clear images, but you can have this even one hour after the treatment if you use contrast enhanced ultrasound. Of course, contrast enhanced ultrasound is expensive, requires the injection of a contrast media even if they are gas bubbles inside a vein. And most important, is not allowed in many countries for this use. And so it's a off-label use. Oh, spongiform nodules are the ideal because they are very soft and you can destroy them at, well, with a complete satisfaction. That is when you have a, a spongiform nodules that becomes over three centimeters and starts compressing the trachea or is uh, uh, well visible at glance, well, the treatment provides you with uh, excellent results. And uh, the preferred technique, I didn't touch this aspect uh, because um, 
because uh, well, the techniques were treated by Giovanni. Uh, I would say that I already said which are the specific circumstances when we prefer laser, especially for uh, malignancy. Uh, otherwise, we prefer radiofrequency uh, because uh, the moving of the electric needle allow you a more complete destruction of the nodule. And so, generally speaking, you have a, a greater area of ablation with the radio frequency that, than with the laser. Uh, the cost is quite similar. We are, in Italy at least, about 800, 900, 1,000 euros. It depends uh, from the company, from the institution, from how many uh, treatments you perform uh, each year. But, of course, the technique is uh, a bit expensive. And so I completed my answers. I don't know if there are other questions. Okay, thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, if you can stay with us after the third presentation by Professor Deak, uh, maybe uh, there will arise another issues. So if you can stay with us, uh, uh, you can join again. No problem, Tamash. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, go back to one of the questions. Uh, similarly to all other uh, webinars of the Papillon seminars, it will be presented on the website by Sunday, uh, the recording of this uh, event. So everybody has the opportunity uh, to review. It will be available, I guess, till September. So uh, we turn to our third program. Uh, Professor Akos Deak is the head of the Oncology Intervention Department at Semmelweis University, Budapest, Hungary. He has performed thyroid nodule thermoablation treatments since 2014, and he was the first to use the procedure in the East Central European region. So he is our uh, local god regarding uh, radio frequency and thermal ablation. Please, uh, Professor Deak, uh, please Akos. Uh, your presentation. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to show you the uh, radio frequency ablation uh, technique. I will share you uh, a video uh, showing the procedure. I hope you you see. Yes, we see. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, uh, as you see on the on the split screen, uh, there is an ultrasound display uh, at the top uh, of the of the screen, and uh, on the uh, it's, it's a real time image of the procedure. And the lower left picture is the operation site, as you see. And uh, the lower right is the display of the RF uh, generator. So, and uh, uh, we started uh, uh, usually after disinfection, uh, as after disinfecting the area, we uh, create sterile conditions with the with the isolating set uh, around the desired area, as uh, Giovanni uh, showed you. And um, after we measured uh, the nodule uh, to be treated and depicted the anatomical situation around the ablation site, we start infiltrating the area. Uh, and um, after a small incision with a, uh, with a scalpel, as you see, we perform uh, after the, the anterolateral um, hydrodissection the posterior hydrodissection or the hydrodissection of the danger uh, triangle, the danger zone. It's uh, very important uh, just to avoid the damage of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. 
and uh, of course the esophagus uh, behind the trachea and the trachea itself. So we kind of uh, fill this uh, virtual space, the trachea esophageal groove uh, with, uh, with glucose, with dextrose uh, solution. And so uh, the nodule uh, we want to treat is, is floating actually uh, in this fluid. So when you do the treatment, uh, you can elevate the nodule from this area and you can perform uh, a safe uh, procedure. Um, as you see, uh, the nodule is surrounded now by uh, water, so uh, we can introduce our ablation needle. Uh, it's actually the same uh, system as uh, Giovanni showed you from a different uh, company, but uh, uh, also a water-cooled system. And I would like to go back just for a short second. Uh, uh, we go also um, a transismic approach. Transismic approach, uh, and we depict the major feeding vessel of uh, of the thyroid uh, nodule. And after uh, placing the needle in the most lowest, most posterior position, then we perform the ablation. As you see, uh, we start at 50 watts. And uh, when we experience that uh, with 50 watts, we don't see enough uh, uh, transient hyperechogenic zone. Then we go up to 60 watts, and as you see, uh, the ablation goes uh, much more effective and faster. So, um, as you see, the vessels are already containing small gas bubbles, so we can go on to a more uh, superficial uh, area. And uh, the transismic approach is also very important because uh, when we ablate uh, the nodule, uh, hot fluid is uh, uh, coming out uh, from the puncture site or could come out from the puncture site, which can be painful. And uh, the transismic approach helps us to keep the needle in place and also the normal uh, parenchyma of, uh, of the isthmus uh, works as an isolation for, for this uh, hot fluid so that it uh, won't come out. So, uh, during the ablation, we can perform uh, color Doppler, as you saw on the previous pictures, and uh, we can uh, look for uh, another uh, feeding vessel. Sometimes it's, uh, it's easy, sometimes it's not uh, to find the right vessel, but um, uh, because sometimes the nodule is, uh, is feeded by, by more uh, vessels, not just the inferior or, or superior, uh, uh, but uh, it can have more arteries. So, we try to uh, close as much arteries as possible. And uh, when we are successful doing that, uh, then, then the ablation procedure can be much faster because without the arteries, there is no uh, heat sink effect, which can influence our ablation. Heat sink effect is the effect when uh, the arteries around or inside the nodule are taking away uh, the heat, what we are giving to the nodule. So it works as a coolant system. Uh, but if we close these arteries, then the ablation goes uh, much more effective and, and much faster. So after we close the arteries, I usually go from the lower pole to the upper pole uh, of the nodule uh, because uh, uh, I usually start with the um, with the uh, with the hardest part, so I usually start with the least uh, visualized 
uh, area. And then uh, when I uh, go on, I go more uh, uh, towards the head and to the upper pole uh, of, the, of the thyroid nodule. But it's a rule that uh, I go and or, or anybody who performs the moving shot technique, uh, we go from the posterior part to the anterior part, uh, but it depends on the operator. As you see, uh, there are small gas bubbles also in the jugular vein. It's absolutely normal. And uh, when uh, small bubbles are uh, going in the capsular veins, uh, of the uh, thyroid nodule is always a good sign uh, that you're in the in a good uh, uh, what wattage and um, and uh, you are in a in a good position and uh, you are effective so uh, of course uh, performing uh, a color doppler is is not always uh, a good solution because the transient hyperechogenic zone disturbs the picture uh, very much. But uh, after waiting maybe uh, a few minutes, uh, the the bubbles uh, disappear, and uh, and you will see the undertreated uh, areas. Yeah, the venous drainage uh, drives the small bubbles in the jugular vein. But uh, actually, it's uh, it's not an issue. It's not a problem. Uh, it will uh, disappear. It won't cause uh, any embolism or or something like this. So as uh, uh, at the end, we perform the uh, the ablation of the capsular veins. Uh, uh, it's also an important part. Um, when you close the, the drainage veins of the nodule, then uh, the, com the, the, uh, the ablation uh, will be complete. Um, the most problematic part uh, of the ablation is to visualize the needle, because uh, you can do the ablation only then when you see the needle. Uh, and uh, you may think that uh, to see the needle in this cloudy area is uh, very difficult. Uh, I would say yes, uh, but if you are always in plane with the needle and with the linear head, when you're always in plane with the needle, you will see uh, the outer part of the needle and then you will find the tip of the needle for sure. But of course, it needs practice but uh, it will come uh, with time. It's uh, it's not an issue, I think. I usually always uh, go with the uh, with the needle to the border of the ablated and unablated area, and uh, uh, with the time you will feel the difference between the treated uh, tissue and the untreated tissue, because the treated tissue is uh, it's 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 more much harder because it will contain. Uh, much less fluid, much less water, because it, it evaporates uh, with the ablation. And uh, you can go uh, precisely uh, at the borderline of the treated and the uh, untreated area. So as you see, there are already small bubbles at the capsule, uh, so we are uh, effective. Uh, when you see this fine uh, shining rim around the nodule, then you can be sure that, uh, that the nodule is uh, very well treated. Of course, uh, it's also important uh, uh, what um, uh, Professor Papin said, uh, the, 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 the absolute perfect knowledge of the neck uh, anatomy and the depiction of the vagal nerve and uh, the, the depiction of the, of the uh, superficial arteries is a very important thing, which is also important is uh, uh, to, to position the needle in the right uh, way because the less uh, uh, you uh, stitch the, your needle in the nodule, the better, because um, because uh, 
if uh, there are more holes uh, on the thyroid capsule, then the possibility of nodule rupture is, uh, is much higher. As you see, uh, we waited a few minutes and, uh, and there is uh, another uh, major vessel uh, which was cooling this area is seen here. So uh, we, we repositioned the needle and, uh, and do another ablation zone uh, here. And uh, with this will be the, the ablation uh, perfect. You see the difference between the unablated and ablated area but uh, it's also very well seen that, uh, that the transient hyperechogenic zone appears immediately when we uh, start the, the power. Um, the, the system is water-cooled, so uh, actually we use ice or icy water. Uh, it's enough to have uh, around 10 to 20 uh, mls of water and if the rest is uh, ice it's fine so we usually use a one liter uh, uh, um, bottle of uh, of icy water and uh, it will cool the system uh, for the uh, 15 20 minutes uh, until the procedure uh, ends so uh, we are about to, to finish uh, the ablation. Uh, a few last checkup, uh, and you see the small bubbles around the module. Everything is closed. Uh, I, I wanted to treat this, uh, this vessel again. Sometimes these vessels, even if they are around one millimeter, they are very strong, and the circulation is so fast in these uh, uh, arteries that uh, it cools uh, the RF needle if, uh, if you cannot puncture it directly. So sometimes you have to apply more power, but in this case the, the carotid sheet is, is uh, very close, so uh, we have to be uh, very patient and, um, and, uh, and treat it in, in, a, in, a, in a patient way. Okay, and um, I think uh, that's all, um, and thank you very much for your attention, and, uh, and please, if you have any questions, I will try to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Sharpush, for this excellent presentation. As I realized, it was a continuous recording, not edited, so it was from the start you the end without any cutting a, f a few uh, short cuts i few. took out yes. a few okay okay how many uh, time requires a uh, uh, session of course uh, it depends on the 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 size of the nodule um, sometimes we treat uh, very big nodules and uh, it can take um, um, now uh, 40 minutes maybe but uh, the uh, effective ablation time uh, also uh, when, when, the, uh, when the generator works, it won't go over 20 minutes, even okay. with, the, with, the, with the largest nodules. Okay, thank you. Actually, we have two questions in the chat. Uh... Uh, what happens later with the ablated uh, tissue? Um, yes. Uh, Actually, what we see is uh, uh, after one month uh, that, um, in, in my case, uh, the 50% uh, shrinkage is the minimum uh, at the first month. Um, and by the time, of course, there, there will be always some small residue. Maybe in 10% of the cases, you can, you can destroy completely everything. But uh, there one or two millimeters of tissue will remain, and uh, but the but the rest of the area will uh, disappear 
in uh, in depending on the size and of course depending on the necrotic tissue we in, in one one or two years so of course with larger nodules maybe it takes two years but uh, but the question is what is your aim uh, if your aim is a is a better cosmetic result to relieve the 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 the, uh, the pain and the discomfort in the neck then uh, you're uh, you're perfect in 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 half a year because in half a year the nodule reaches uh, the 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 wanted shrinkage but but uh, yes the the immune system takes it away from the to that tissue uh, <clears throat> Uh, do you offer power Doppler or color Doppler if uh, we can't reach CUS? I perform CUS in case of uh, malignant nodules uh, and uh, and local recurrences or metastatic lymph nodes. Uh, in benign nodules, I I never use uh, CUS. Uh, for me, uh, color Doppler is uh, is uh, is satisfying. Um, so this is my opinion about it. And uh, marginal venous ablation at the end of the ablation, uh, as you saw, yes. And I, I try to uh, finish it with uh, with uh, a marginal venous ablation at the end. Uh, when the procedure is completed, the initial hydrodissection is not visible. What do you think should be done to ensure this continues? So, uh, usually, uh, the amount of uh, of uh, glucose solution is uh, is enough to maintain the the uh, the distance between the danger zone and uh, and the nodule or the or the treated area. So. <clears throat> Uh, because because even when you don't see the water exactly, it gives the uh, the thyroid gland the movability. So you can you can move your needle and elevate uh, the nodule, or you can elevate the the thyroid gland uh, in a more uh, anterior position, and then you will have a safe distance uh, from the critical structures. That's that's what I think. Uh, of course, there are uh, more um, thicker materials. You can give higher uh, percentage of of uh, glucose. Um, it's it, it can be also a solution, but uh, I think it's it's not uh, really necessary. So I I never had a problem uh, from it after a thousand ablations. Um, uh, if if the uh, you treat a para uh, parathyroid gland um, with RF or or microwave whatever, um, then you can keep and I think you should keep uh, a needle in place uh, in in this uh, dangerous uh, area, and uh, if it if 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 uh, a voice change occurs with the pain, then you can give cold saline uh, in case of microwave or or cold uh, dextrose uh, in or cold glucose in in the case of uh, radio frequency uh, to avoid the damage of the nerve uh, what's the minimal distance between the needle tip and nodule capsule uh, i would say uh, around two millimeters two three millimeters but uh, as uh, the transient hyperechogenic zone builds up, you will see exactly where the bubbles are, and it usually uh, represents uh, the heated area. So uh, I think it's it's a reliable method. Does puncture of the vessel not cause bleeding problem during the ablation? Um, yes, bleeding bleeding can be an issue. Uh, sometimes bleeding can help you, and uh, sometimes uh, bleeding can cause trouble. Sometimes the bleeding uh, works as a hydrodissection, 
during the ablation. If the blood goes in the right direction, for example, in the danger triangle, and it, it not, and it's not a big, uh, big bleeding, then, then it's okay and it, it can help you. But um, when, when the bleeding goes anteriorly uh, to the thyroid, uh, then it's not comfortable uh, to work through uh, a great hematoma. It's, it's not nice and it can cause a problem. Um, once a patient had, for example, uh, what, what we didn't know, not even the, uh, the anesthesiologist, that uh, uh, has uh, panic syndrome, the patient, and uh, after the bleeding, uh, uh, there was a, a, a bigger trouble because the, the patient wanted to run away uh, from the site. So uh, bleeding, bleeding can be tricky, but um, that's why it's very important to depict the exact anatomy and uh, try not to puncture any uh, capsular artery or larger capsular vein uh, during the ablation. Why glucose solution? Um, uh, because of radio frequency. We need an anionic uh, solution because uh, when you use ionic solution like, uh, like uh, 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 saline, then uh, you cannot uh, predict uh, the motion of of the ions, and it can it can cause uh, a bigger uh, uh, heating around the nodule, and uh, it can cause problem or damage of the nerves. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions. I have one more. Uh, uh... Patients with bleeding disorders, uh, what is your approach uh, to perform the procedure? Uh, with the bleeding? Bleeding disorders. Uh, bleeding disorders. Uh, uh, I forgot to tell that uh, after the bleeding, or if, if a bleeding occurs, it's, it's very rare, uh, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, we have to wait uh, three weeks. And after three weeks, uh, you can go on with the procedure. Of course, you have to be more careful by depicting the, the anatomy. Uh, bleeding disorders, uh, yes, uh, it, it, can, it can be a problem. So, uh, in case of um, a bleeding disorder or, or medication, uh, we send the patient always to our uh, anesthesiologist Sometimes we have to change to uh, uh, heparin, and uh, and uh, and then to, uh, we have to stop it before uh, uh, the day uh, of the procedure. So that's that's what happens. But uh, with uh, with the aspirin, um, um, it's it's not a problem. Um, we can do it. Okay. Sometimes you cannot stop the aspirin because of different kind of implants and so on. Okay. Any questions either to Professor Papini or to Professor Deak? If not, first of all, thank you very much for our today presenters for the kind uh, lectures and excellent lectures. I think that we learned much, uh, especially I learned many uh, about these techniques uh, and I am very grateful that I could hear your presentation. Uh, I thank you for the participation in this entire Papio seminars. And as I uh, mentioned, uh, the recorded versions can be reached until uh, by till, till September. And I raise your attention for another opportunity. Uh, we will announce the next Papillon course, which will start from September 15, uh, and uh, you can uh, register here. Here you see the invitation parts of uh, the course. Uh, here you can register. It. So this will be the third Papillon course, and uh, we will be very glad if uh, any of you would participate. I raise the attention to those colleagues who participated in the previous courses that we have, uh, we announced 
the webinars uh, for a, a discounted charge. So if somebody is not uh, in, uh, interested in the entire full course, uh, he or she can choose uh, one or more of the 22 webinars. So the registration is open. Now you can find tyroside.com and, and here the next year Papillon course. So once more, thank you very much for your attention and participation. Uh, have a good night and finally, thank you very much, Andy Hopapini and Arkos de Akpar. Thank, thank you very much, have a good night. Many thanks. It was uh, so well educational and so well friendly. That was uh, a great occasion. Thank you, Tamash. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.